I would like to introduce you to our three speakers today. So we have Kate Fritz, the Chief Executive Officer at the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Ida Hall is a waterman and Amani Black is the CEO and founder of Minorities in Aquaculture. And I would like to invite Kate Fritz um, to speak about her experience fishing on, the well, throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Thank you, Marisa. I appreciate the introduction there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join this esteemed panel today. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to join Ida Hall and Imani Black, women who work the water for their livelihoods. So thank you, Marisa and Rachel and the Bay Program for inviting me to, to speak about recreational fishing. So for those I haven't met, my name is Kate Fritz, and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I've been in the conservation and restoration business my entire career, and I'm lucky enough to have found a line of work that also fuels my passion. So I just want to say at the beginning here that sometimes I catch fish, but mostly I'm just out there flailing around and fishing and enjoying myself. I learned early in my life that it's called fishing for a reason and it's not called catching. And I also learned early in my life that in order to do big things, you must do the things that scare you the most, that force you to step out of your comfort zone. I wanna talk a little bit about that today. So with fishing and a lifelong pursuit of fearlessness as my background and context, I'd like to tell you about my personal journey into recreational fly fishing. So personally, I'm, I don't consider myself to be from anywhere. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. I have lived and played in over 17 different watersheds around the United States and Brazil, which doesn't include all of the exotic places I've had the opportunity and good fortune to travel to. From Long Island Sound to Lake Pontchartrain to the Rio Pinheiros in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to the Bushkill and Beaver Run Lake in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I've had the chance to see, touch, and enjoy so many different types of water. Um, Marisa, uh, so, okay, thank you for changing to the first slide. On the left there, I'm uh, fishing uh, off the coast of Emerald Isle with my father, getting into some Spanish mackerel many years ago. And on the right there, I'm enjoying a respite by the Beaver Run Lake up in the Pocono Mountains. So as the daughter of two Aquariuses, I think my love of the water comes very naturally. But despite moving around a lot, I've always considered one place to truly be my home, the Beaver Run Hunting and Fishing Club in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. The Bushkill Stream and the Beaver Run Lake are my home waters. I first went up there when I was nine months old and I've been every year of my life, many times a year um, since then. If you go to the next slide, Marisa, please. So my grandfather was a member of this hunting and fishing club, and then my dad became a member. And now I have the honor of being the third generation of my family to be a member of the Beaver Run Hunting and Fishing Club. And I also have the distinction of being the first woman in 124 years to become a member at Beaver Run. This is a photo of me catching a very large mouth bass uh, with a, a bobber and a worm off the front dock. Um, and my grandfather uh, very proudly wrote this note, um, uh, bragging a little bit about his seven-year-old granddaughter who'd caught this ginormous bass um, from the front lawn. And I just wanted to share that, ex that uh, experience in that moment that when I think back to fishing and where I got started, this is very much part of my own origin story. So as a, as a club, the Beaver Run's mission is to propagate, protect, and conserve game, fish, and wildlife. And as individual club members, we enjoy nature and the conservation of nature's beauty, fish, and wildlife. And we are people who enjoy hunting and fishing in the fellowship of kindred souls in a beautiful and secluded spot in the Pennsylvania mountains, literally written into our bylaws that way. See, I love to be around because it never changed. It was always the same. No matter where I went or where we moved in my life, Beaver Run was always the same. I knew that I could fish in the lake or at the trout pond. I knew the trails on the thousand acre, acre property like the back of my hand. And I knew where they offered the best vistas to the lake. My grandfather and my dad taught me how to fish up there. And I harvested blueberries on walks with my grandmother. I learned how to drive up there uh, before I even had a lear learner's permit. And to this day, the club has terrible cell phone reception and spotty Wi-Fi, and I couldn't be more happy to get off the grid up there. Beaver Run is also the reason I learned about conservation, specifically the type of conservation that Gifford Pinchot espoused. 
Gifford Pinchot was the first head of the U.S. Forest Service in 1905 and eventually the 28th governor of Pennsylvania in 1931. Pinchot was a member of Beaver Run in the early 1900s. And I can just imagine Pinchot sitting around the old stone fireplace, trying out some new theories on conservation. He's most famously known for his concept that conservation is the application of common sense to the common problems for the common good. Pinchot believed in managing our natural resources long into the future to benefit the greatest amount of people for the longest amount of time. I've carried that ethos forward with me and has influenced my career and my leadership style. As I started by saying, I've spent my entire career in conservation and restoration work in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. In college, I helped grow and cultivate eelgrass, which is a submerged aquatic vegetation down in the St. Mary's River. I helped collect water quality data around Montgomery and Prince George's counties in Maryland. I provided environmental plan review for land use develops, developments using my wetland delineation and forest stand delineation skills to hold the letter of the law in place in regards to development and protecting our natural resources. And now my career has been to lead nonprofit organizations who are doing restoration work at a very local level. I guess when you sum it all up, you could call me a Jill of all trades and a master of none. So uh, Marisa, if you can go to the, the next slide, please. So this origin story brings me to almost a year ago, mid pandemic, when I purchased my first fly fishing setup. I had a new year's resolution of spending a thousand, a thousand hours outside last year of which I got to almost 900, I'm very proud of that. And I don't think there was a moment that turned me onto fly fishing, but instead it was many moments that culminated into a feeling that felt like I was missing out on something that was so close at hand to me my whole life. I was having conversations with Adam Miller, the Alliance's communications director, and Sean Kimbrough, an Alliance board member who are passionate anglers, fly anglers and spin anglers alike. And I realized that fly fishing would bring a few of my passions into one obsession worthy new hobby, fly fishing. Fly fishing had the ability to bring all of these things to one place to me. Hydrology, geomorphology, ichthyology, entomology, hiking, buying new gear, preparing for an adventure. And what I didn't know was that it also included lots of high fives on the streams with the folks that I got out to meet and learn about on the river. So once I started getting out into the rivers of the Chesapeake in a new way, I discovered the peace of standing quietly in a burbling stream, just observing. I enjoyed being still and quiet. My husband accuses me of never sitting down or standing still, but fly fishing forces me to be aware of my presence on the stream and therefore I had to be present fully when I fly fish. I quickly understood how fly fishing is like a river meditation if you let yourself be there. So to quote Jessica Maxwell, the words that come to mind is intimacy, the closeness that comes from closeness, an immutable and an intrinsic partnership with being so wonderfully expressed by the lifelong dance between bewitched fly fishermen and fish. I had spent so much time observing rivers and streams from different angles, and this new form of access to these waterways just made sense. So that's my origin story. It's how I came to fly fishing and the lived experience that has shaped how I get there, how I got there, and the many times that I've had to step out of my comfort zone as the new kid. Everyone has different stories, and no one person's adventure looks the same, but they're all equally valid and important. So I want to wrap up with talking about two intersecting things that coincide with my origin story being a female fly angler, and the work of conservation and restoration. So as I've gotten my boots under me in the last year and I ventured down the many avenues of learning about fly fishing, I began to look around for other women. I've always found myself in a field that was generally male dominated and fly fishing was no different. Many times fishing with all men means that I had to step out of my comfort zone and build a bridge over my self-consciousness of being the odd lady out. Much like any elder millennial, I turned to social media to see if I could find a network of female fly anglers, and lo and behold, I did. There are so many women across this country that have been making and holding inclusive space for other women, such as United Women on the Fly and Trout Unlimited. I began to follow these groups, which has led me to meet other women who also fly fish. There's a large network out there, and I'm excited to be another dot on the map in this regard. Personally, I've been on a journey of my own racial awakening and racial diversity and inclusion are important values to me. There are far too few women of color in the world of fly fishing, from what I can tell. My own experience with fly fishing was that it was full of barriers if you didn't grow up with someone showing you the ropes of how to fly fish. 
The gear can be expensive. If you are not comfortable in the outdoors, it seems like a Herculean hurdle to overcome. That's why we need more mentors who are actively seeking to nurture any spark of interest in angling, spinning, or fly fishing. As a female leader on this big, scary Chesapeake stage, I believe it is my responsibility to cultivate and grow other leaders. And so I feel the same about fly fishing. It is my responsibility to share the spark, to nurture the flame, and to give it a platform to burn as brightly as anyone who is interested, anyone is interested. So I'm here to attest that fly fishing does not have to be all river runs through it. It can be what you wanna make out of it. It can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. And if you're new to the sport or looking for an introduction to the sport, I would be happy to take anyone out streamside. It's time for me to pay it forward. And final, <clears throat> finally, the intersection of conservation. Fly fishing overlaps wholly with conservation and restoration work. Every time it rains, I think about all the dirt and topsoil being washed into our rivers and streams, hundreds of miles upstream of the Chesapeake Bay proper. I think about this spawning yellow perch whose eggs will be smothered by the incoming sediment. And I thought, think about the eventual dead zone that will result in the Chesapeake as summer temperatures warm the water and burns through the oxygen in the water column. I like to fish upstream, which coincides with the exact places where we need to do conservation and restoration work. As an organization, the Alliance's mission is to bring together communities, companies, and conservationists to restore the lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. We do that through, through uh, three boots on the ground delivery programs in forests, agriculture, and green infrastructure and through our fourth program in stewardship and engagement. As an organization, we are focusing upstream to prevent problems where they start on the land. These upstream solutions prevent downstream problems. So when the Alliance is doing on the ground work like planting riparian forest buffers that provide shade for a stream and whose roots hold together the eroding land, we are doing fish habitat work. We are investing in work for a future where the 19 million racially diverse women, men, children in the Chesapeake Bay can safely access their local waterways without fear of getting sick. We are investing in restoring special places that are unraveling at the pace of land development and climate change. We are investing in the sustainability of the future and as old Gifford Pinchot would say, the greatest good for the largest amount for the longest time. So I encourage you to step out of your comfort zone. If you have an interest in fly fishing, I'd be happy to help lead you into it. And I just wanna leave everyone with one more quote and about why fly fishing has, has become such an important part of my own mental health um, routine and part of my own conservation ethic. I'm again gonna quote Jessica Maxwell. One thing you can say about fly fishing, it gets you out there where both nature and spirit reside in relative peace free of the baggage of the human mind, except for what you drag in yourself. So thank you to speak the program for having me. And I look forward to hearing from Ida and Amani. Thank you, Kate, for that wonderful walkthrough, um, your own journey finding fly fishing and also your connection with conservation. So now I'd like to introduce Ida Hall, who is joining us on the phone. And Ida, you can take it away from here. Well, thank you so much. And I just want to commend Kate for the incredible work that she's done in conservation and to protect the Chesapeake Bay and the resources for all of us. So it's a hard act to follow. Um, but I think I have a story to share. I know I've been very blessed who have had family that grew up on the Chesapeake Bay. I did not. Like my brothers, I grew up in the city of Danville, Virginia, where our father practiced medicine. He had left um, his family home on the Chesapeake Bay in rural Northumberland County, Virginia, um, some years ago. Uh, but most all of our holidays and vacations were spent visiting grandparents, and Uncle Ben and Aunt Louise, who still lived on the farm. Well, the distance between the northern neck or Northumberland County and the city of Danville was only approximately 250 miles. It was a journey from city to the farm. It was a journey back in time to another remote, isolated world. Coming from the city, I had never seen so much land, undeveloped forest, and open farmland, and beaches, and the Chesapeake Bay 
that seemed to stretch to the end of the world. It was awesome. And someone like me who loved the outdoors as well as did my brothers, I felt as, I felt more at home, actually, in this setting than I really had in the city. Um, there was there was freedom to explore, and I certainly felt very alive in this rural environment. And I loved the water and the beaches and the fun of being going out in the road bay, boat through my creek to get to the beach and the bay shore. It was an adventure. This was probably, this, this continued through the fifth, early 50s through the 1960s. By 1964, now I was a 14-year-old teenager in high school and a cheerleader, and I was happy with my friends and living in the city and getting an education that I did appreciate. Maybe not them, but I certainly do. I did later. In June of 1964, my mother was going to be in the hospital for a couple of weeks, so my parents arranged for me to come and stay with Uncle Ben and Aunt Louise and my grandmother while she was gone. And my brother James got the duty of chauffeuring me there and spending some time there as he loved um, being in the on the bay as well. As we drove down the lane, my brother James made a simple suggestion that I might like to, that one way to use up some of the time while I was there, spend the time, would be to go out on our cousin Hal's work boat when he fished pound nets. Well, I was very trusting of my brother, and, you know, he never really steered me too wrong. So I didn't know what a pound net was, but we went out the next morning before sunup on this beautiful, gorgeous morning in June, and I was so enthralled and captivated by the beauty and this massive bay and being on the water in the early morning at sunrise to go and fish. Um, when we got to the trap, I would sit, I sat on the bow as, as Hal would raise the net and fish began erupting on the surface. I was even more in awe of the abundant life on the bottom of the bay and the people, watermen, actually made a living working so close to nature. It didn't get any better than this. I instantly thought, this is what I want to do. And even as I thought it, I knew it was a foolish dream. Just the physical labor involved in driving state was raising a net full of fish and crabs were beyond my capabilities. But I continued to go out with Hal every day he fished that summer, not for two weeks, but for eight weeks. And every holiday, vacation, or school break, um, I would return and go eat on Hal's boat or watch him when he tarred his nets, prepared his um, pine trees for his stakes to hang the uh, net around. Um, I just couldn't get enough of it. By 1972, actually in August of 1972, I was a recent graduate from William and Mary with a degree in psychology, and this was also the same year of Hurricane Agnes. And I was also a young woman. And Hal was not doing as much pound net fishing because monofilament gill nets now replaced the cotton nets and were gaining in popularity for commercial fishing. Because, because my, well, because I was a graduate and I'd finished work in Danville, I was planning to come for two weeks. Before looking for work, I still had friends at William and Mary, only a short distance from the northern neck. But both of my brothers were also spending more time on the farm. My brother James had bought a gill net and was fulfilling his dream of working on the water. And Hal would ultimately give up his pound nets to gill nets. And the longer my brothers would stay or visit the farm, the longer I stayed. By the spring of 17, or early sometime in 1973, my brother James began gill netting with Hal. Um, for a short time until he would begin practicing his med practicing medicine on the eastern shore. So he gave me his gill net, and 
um, later on my birthday, a pair of oil skins. Well, you know, you don't want to <laughs> not use the nut, so it took me a while, but finally sometime, I think in late April, I successfully set and fished the 100-fathom gill net and caught $54 worth of striped bass that I got my cousin Hal to sell because I was too timid. It was exciting, and I was hooked. Therefore, time, another cousin, Jimmy Kelly, was buying food fish in the creek, and I got very brave and started selling fish there. Um, then by 1975, Keepon found in bluefish in the James River had a tremendous impact on marketing fish throughout the bay. Um, and also that year, my son, who had been um, a very close and taught me so much about the farm and boats and respect for the water, he suddenly passed away. And it seemed as though I was destined to stay longer, even than I, even than I already had, because my aunt needed um, some guidance with the farm, and my uncle had without me realizing it, been preparing me for that. Um, so I stayed even longer. By the 1980s, after both my parents had passed away and I had more expenses, I began to focus on crab potting, peeler potting, and gill netting. Um, and I was not a business-minded, and I never will be. But by the late um, 1980s and through the 1990s, I was fishing pulling by hand on a daily basis, six days a week at least, 100 crab pots, 30 peeler pots, and a 100-fathom gill net, which I, um, as I said, pull by hand, very much like what my cousin Hal did and other crabbers did. And I also shed a few soft crabs. By now, I was selling my own fish to Kathy Davenport, my hardened soft crabs, to the Croxons, Mike and Alice, and later Mikey and Tammy. Um, and over the years, I had met other women that um, were very much addicted to working on the water in their own way. I know Ethel Hudnell, Palmer Hudnell's wife, was very passionate about poling her wooden flat bottom skip around the creek shore. And she knew what she was doing because she could spot a soft crab just by the outlines in the mud, and she could catch them by the hundreds, as could my cousin Hal and my Hearst cousins, Margie, Lucille, Helen, and Charlotte. I never was quite that good, and I never will be, but I did actually have an opportunity to see it at one time, to see the crabs. By the 21st century, the population of crabs is fluctuating a lot. The fisheries are changing somewhat. The number of crab pots um, I could, was allowed to fish had dropped to 85 crab pots. There were bushel limits. There was an eight-hour workday. Mandatory harvest reporting had begun in 1993. Um, and so the bay was changing and the way and the number of watermen was diminish, diminishing. Um, in 2002, I had the unbelievable privilege of being appointed by the governor of Virginia to be the first woman from Virginia to serve on the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. So I got to see about managing fishery from the other side where you make regulations, and it is very challenging. Um, in 2005, my brothers and I would place a conservation easement on our family farm so that we could forever preserve the values that we treasured for future generations of hopefully our family and others. Um, and just last year, I began selling crabs to a new buyer, Billy and Aaron Haney, um, who's, who's two teenage daughters, crabs in the summer, and their whole family have commercial licenses. I think women have always been a part of the waterman's way of life. They were certainly on board several of the crabbing boats that I would see the summers I went out with Hal. Um, some of them actually pulled the pots for their husbands. Um, 
others maybe help call the crib. And I know that for me, when I began this journey, initially, and even now, I, I had no plans to change anything by commercial fishing and crabbing. I wanted to be a part of it, to learn the ways of the water, to understand them, and to preserve and carry on a family tradition, um, and be a part of the waterman's unique, valuable, respected way of life. I love being in the outdoors, still do, love li- living and working close to nature and wildlife. I have been incredibly blessed and so privileged to live a life beyond my wildest dreams. It wouldn't have happened without the support of God and family, especially, and friends. Um, and it's just been a real honor and privilege to be able to share this life with um, the Chesapeake Bay Program. Thank you. Thank you, Ida, for sharing your story. And next up, we have Imani Black, who's the CEO and founder of Minorities in Aquaculture. Hi, everyone. Thank you um, for that introduction. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, Great job, Kate and Ida. Um, I think that you guys touch on a lot of things that I'm going to touch on, but I think that it just shows the the synergy of um, how we all feel about the Chesapeake Bay um, and how important it is to us. So um, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Yep. Okay, so I a little bit about me. Um, I am originally from Chestertown, so born and raised on the Eastern Shore, um, and I have always loved everything about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I actually knew that I wanted to do something in restoration and conservation um, when I was seven years old. I went to um, a, my first science camp at Horn Point Laboratory in Cambridge, um, where we spent an entire week learning about blue crabs and oysters, smart aquatic vegetation, striped bass, um, and just conservation ways, you know, within the Chesapeake Bay system. And ever since then, I've kind of gotten bitten by the bug, uh, you can say. And I've always known that doing something with restoration and conservation in the environment was something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, But when I was growing up on the Eastern Shore, I wasn't always very, keen on staying on the Eastern Shore. Um, I recently found out there's a a term called small town syndrome, which if anybody has like ever, (laughs) has ever experienced it, basically what it is is that you just feel really constricted by the small confinements of like what you think your hometown is gonna be. And I was no stranger to that. I only had two requirements um, for the colleges I was picking. Um, One, they, it had to be outside of the state of Maryland. And two, it had to be uh, enough distance away that my parents had to take off of work to come and visit me. Um, Luckily, uh, next slide, please. I settled on Old Dominion University where I happened to play division one lacrosse and major in marine biology. Um, So perfectly four hours right on the dot, technically outside of Maryland, um, but still on the coast. And I never really realized um, while I was in college um, how much I was really, you know, passionate about certain things about the environment. I loved conservation and restoration of the entire planet, but when you are on a, you know, coastal community that is like ocean bound, it's more oceanography, not freshwater, you know, ecology or anything like that. So I went, you know, I thought that that's what I wanted to do. I was like, I'm going to be a tropical biologist. I'm going to travel around the world. I'm going to, you know, research, you know, exotic animals and organisms. Um, I, you know, got scuba, scuba, uh, scuba certified in Belize and was like fully intended on doing that. Um, got back from Belize because I kind of figured that I didn't want to go into the academia route. And luckily I had an internship doing oyster restoration uh, with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And it was a crew full of women um, that were just completely just over the top and intelligent and, you know, excuse my language, badass. They were just amazing. And from that very first day, I remember going back to my car and saying, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Like, I don't, 
really know how I'm going to make it work. Like, I don't really know what next steps I go from here, but like, this is what I want to do. It just like solidified it. Um, so after I finished lacrosse, um, I went to, um, you know, I, after that internship, my boss was like, well, if you're interested in oyster restoration, have you looked into ochre culture? And at the time we were stationed at Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And she said, well, VIMS has, you know, an oyster aquaculture training program. If you're interested, you should, you should apply. At the time, um, again, I was still going through my senior year. Um, that year, 2016, um, my lacrosse team actually won our conference championship and went to the second round of the NCAAs. So I went to VIMS and I said, if my schedule isn't going to work out, you know, I don't want to take someone else's place, but I'm really interested in doing a program um, so I can just apply next year. Luckily, long story short, they were just really willing to work with my schedule. And that was my first introduction into awkward culture. And again, on that very first day, I had that same feeling as I did with Chesapeake Bay Foundation of, oh, wow, like this could be something that I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, even though it was completely new to me, I liked being outside. Um, being an athlete all my life, I am no stranger to pushing myself past its physical limits, you know, being out in the hot sun. Um, I think that the physical intensity and the physical labor of aquaculture is really was one of the things that really attracted me to the industry. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then from there, <clears throat> um, I went to, you know, I learned all things aquaculture. So from uh, the hatchery, nursery and farm, um, and really started to hone in on my skills of aquaculture. Then after that, I went on to my first, um, my first oyster farm, um, not too far from Vim's. And that dream of, I want to do this for the rest of my life was still there. But then this was the point in my life where I really saw some of the challenges that were really engulfed and kind of encapsulated into aquaculture. My first aquaculture job, I was the only woman out of 25 guys. So <laughs> you, could, you could see how going from full women crews up to that point would be a little shell shocking. Um, I learned a lot uh, personally and work-wise. Um, I learned really, not only did I hone in my skills of aquaculture and being an oyster farmer, but I really honed in my skills of like getting the confidence to like really put myself out there in male dominated fields. And from there, my, you know, aquaculture career was kind of really just about that, about being in a male dominated field and me having to like really try to work through that. Um, next slide, please. So we all know about, you know, the historic Chesapeake Bay fisheries. And I want to go a little bit back in history for this because I know it seems like I'm jumping around, but I swear it's all going to come together. Um, when I first got into aquaculture, I didn't really realize what the progression of aquaculture had been in the Chesapeake Bay. And it wasn't until I really got into the, I would say the, the meat of my career that I realized that the Chesapeake Bay has always been involved with seafood, always been involved with the waterways. We have a history, a heritage and a legacy that we are all very proud of in the Chesapeake Bay. And in a lot of ways, aquaculture was introduced because of the next slide, please because of the historical decline that happened within, within the Chesapeake Bay. And now kind of aquaculture is this new wave of commercial fishing. So we know about the historical declines of the fisheries. Um, we know especially about the oyster decline specifically, how we're less to less than 1% of our historical numbers. And of course we are doing restoration and conservation efforts um, aquaculture being included in that um, with this fat on shell production to, to really mitigate, you know, those issues that we're having. But as time goes on, aquaculture is still becoming the focal point for our sustainable seafood resource. So as much as we relied on the Chesapeake Bay for so many years, for livelihoods, for the nutrition of our families, for just income, we are now moving into aquaculture being that exact same way. But the difference between our Chesapeake Bay commercial fisheries and aquaculture is that not a lot of people really know the true weight that aquaculture is really providing even, even to this day. About 50% to 75% of our seafood that is imported into the United States is already coming from aquaculture. And aquaculture just in 2020 during the pandemic brought in $16.8 billion into the United States. 
So you can see that that is a huge industry that is just increasingly as we go forward, as we are introducing aquaculture into our waterways, one to help move forward the, econo the economics of just seafood in general, but also rebuilding and replenishing our wild, our wild harvest in our, in our waterways is really showing that we could use aquaculture in many different ways to help us achieve all of our goals of restoration and conservation while also feeding ourselves, having food sovereignty and having food security all at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, but the issue is, is that much like Kate and Ida said, there is not a lot of women that are in a lot of these spaces. And aquaculture is no, is not disincluded from that. Like many fishery, you know, science fishery fields, as you can see on, on this chart, there are one out of four faculty members and scientists are women. And less than that, one of 10 of those people are a person of color. And so you're probably wondering why it's, I'm bringing up women, but also bringing up people of color. And again, next slide, please. I'm gonna go back a little bit in history here because again, we are rebuilding. I, and I fully, in, in, in all the things that I do, I'm fully just intending to honor the history and the legacy that the Chesapeake Bay truly holds. So when I say women of color or people of color, I mean the people that are a part of the huge evolution and contribution of historical Chesapeake Bay fisheries today, which is black, which is black watermen on the Chesapeake. 90% 90, 90 of the watermen community in the, 19, in the early 1900s was all African-American from being watermen, boat captains, laborers, shucking houses, everything. We were encapsulated in, and involved in all different areas and aspects of the commercial fishing industry. Moving from the slave trade to learning the waterways to help us escape slavery like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, to then moving that into a livelihood, not just for our families, but as a career of honoring the Chesapeake Bay watershed, of being captains, being charter boat captains, being stewards of the water. You can see here that when I talk about people of color, I'm not talking about a space that they've never been before. I'm talking about a table that we were included in, that we built at one time throughout our history, that I'm, we're just simply now rejoining the conversation. Next slide, please. And not only is it people of color that are missing, again, it's women. And historically, women also have had a huge contribution, no matter what color, in the Chesapeake Bay fisheries. Again, from packing houses to shucking houses to help to, like Ida said, helping their, their husbands out on, on the boat with cages. We have always been involved in commercial fishing. So when I look at the missing demographics in today's fisheries and how women and people of color, underrepresented communities, minorities are not involved in that in that dem in those demographics. It makes me a little. It makes me wonder a little bit. Should we just revert back to our historical ways on the Chesapeake Bay? If we're reverting into this new wave of aquaculture, then shouldn't we be reverting back to when we were thriving in the Chesapeake Bay and all of the people that were involved in that industry at one time? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Okay, so now I get to my kind of journey in this and I'm coming back. So like everybody, 2020 was the year of redirection for me. Again, I was an oyster farmer for about six years before 2020 and I loved my job. All the things that I just talked about that I realized and I love to do, not a lot of women in my spaces, but it was this year that I realized in 2020 when was the last person of color did I ever see in a leadership role in aquaculture? And I just thought that maybe just because I'm, you know, in Maryland and Virginia aquaculture, maybe it's just I hadn't seen them. But then I started asking people of all different ranges of, you know, experience in aquaculture from all over the world. When was the last person, when's the last time you saw a person of color in the United States in a leadership role in aquaculture, farm manager, farm owner, hatchery manager, assistant hatchery manager, anything. And unanimously, everyone said, other than you, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. And it was then, along with the conversation, the heightened conversation of diversity and inclusion, 
that I realized that this issue was a lot bigger than me. It wasn't just something that I hadn't seen. It was something that a lot of people hadn't seen. And when I asked people that question, they weren't asking, they weren't confused, but they were concerned that no one else had asked them that question. They wondered to themselves like, wow, I don't think that I've ever thought about it like that. And me too. I mean, growing up in a predominantly white community, playing predominantly white sports like field hockey and lacrosse, I too wasn't really concerned about race or other, you know, other people, minorities in my spaces because I was used to being the only one. So when I got into awkward culture, it was no different. So when I thought about it, I was like, wow, like this just isn't something that I have just put the blinders on to. This is something that's actually happening. So in 2020, I took a stance. I had no idea anything about, <laughs> about nonprofits, but one thing that really kind of pushed me to starting my, uh, my nonprofit minorities in awkward culture uh, along with the lack of women of color that are in the industry was there was a lot of awkward culture organizations that didn't really express their concern for diversity and inclusion in the beginning. And when they did, their action items were to have these, con these conversations and conferences and forums. And for those of you who don't know, an average conference to go to is around $600. So I asked myself, well, who's gonna be a part of that conversation? Because if one of the barriers of minorities is a financial one, then who's gonna have a seat at that table? So I started Minorities in Anchor Culture in order to have a community of recognition of women of color from all around the world to come together and be educated, but also empowered within their own career of awkward culture. And also within that, awkward culture is suffering a major labor shortage right now, losing about $57 million a year because around 1300 jobs go unfilled every single year. So along with those two things, and along with my love and legacy for the Chesapeake Bay, being coming from a 200 year long line of, of black watermen on the Chesapeake Bay, it is all that I'm encompassing into minorities and awkward culture through everything that we do. Uh, next slide, please. So just to kind of end it out, what minorities and awkward culture does is we provide not only a community, but an opportunity for our women to build their own careers on their own terms. So taking away all of the barriers that minority women face within fisheries, financial, cultural, ethical, we are fully pushing them into all the different aspects of awkward culture so that they can build a career while also helping the labor shortage on their own terms. Kelp, shellfish, finfish, coral, anything that they're interested in, we are providing resources for them to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, I'll end there because we've got about a minute or so until Q&A. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All three presenters um, for sharing your stories and all of the knowledge that's been included along the way in those. We're honored to have all three of you participating today. And throughout these presentations, we've had some questions rolling in from the audience. So we just wanna make sure that all of those are addressed. Um, so Kate and Amani, we do have a question from an audience member saying, as a new angler, it's been hard as a woman. Are there more groups that are female centric around here? And Amani, they also said they're currently struggling with being a very new person of color, female angler, and would love to learn more about your story and others. In response to that, I will say that Imani has participated in several webinars lately, including with her Chesapeake, and she's been interviewed by several of our local magazines, so I'm happy to include those links in the resources, but Kate and Imani, if you'd like to address those questions, um, please do so now. Yeah, well, Kate, I think that you uh, mentioned it, that there are, you know, a number of different, you know, female angler uh, communities out there. I think, you know, within awkward culture, it's sort of the same thing. I feel like we're um, like both industries and Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're growing in those organizations um, in very different ways. But yeah, in awkward culture, you know, there's women in awkward culture. Um, and then I think there's minorities in awkward culture. So I think that, you know, people are kind of really getting um, an idea of that, you know, they wanna have those communities. And so more communities are, are coming out and more communities are being built, which is really great. 
Yeah, Amani, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I think a lot of work has been done in this space, and I feel very honored to walk into uh, a time and a moment where I think there's a lot of um, a focus on bringing women um, into, you know, traditionally male-dominated, um, you know, uh, angling. I'll, I'll speak specifically from recreational angling, and, but not just women, women of color, and you know, thinking beyond just kind of you know white women. And so I, I think this is a moment in time, and um, you know, there's a lot of great work that has been done. A, a couple groups that are local that I would recommend to the to the person asking this question. Um, I see Kelly Kirsch is on uh, our webinar here. Um, she has formed Lancaster Fly Girls. If you're up in the central Pennsylvania area, um, they're constantly getting out fishing together. And um, they're uh, Kelly's a great resource. And um, I, uh, I believe they're a Facebook group group only, so you can check them out, Lancaster Fly Girls. And then another resource which I, I have not plugged in with this group, and they've been on my uh, list to contact is. Uh, Chesapeake Women Anglers um, as another group. I see, I just checked their website. They've got a couple um, events coming up. Um, and so they're, they're a great place to, um, to also plug in with a, a group of female anglers. And then, um, as I said in my presentation, I'm happy to get anybody out stream side for an introductory lesson or just, you know, a catch up phone call, a, a walk in a stream, whatever it is that um, can support you in this journey. Um, my contact information, I think, will be available on our resource page after this presentation. So um, I genuinely mean anybody um, to contact me. I'm happy to help in that. Um, I certainly need to pay that forward in uh, all the folks that have taught me to date. So I'll just throw that in there as well. And this question is for Ida. Ida, do you see changes in the abundance and diversity of aquatic fauna, crabs, fish that you encounter that might be related to climate change? And if so, does our commercial community adapt to those changes? Uh, absolutely. One of um, what comes to my mind immediately is the increase in the population of white shrimp that are frequenting the middle and upper parts of the bay, uh, which is something there you've always been shrimp in the bay, but um, as their water temperatures warm, the population has definitely increased. Um, so it's almost an annual event now, and, and I think there are even CMRC is starting to regulate them. Um, and yeah, that's directly related to the um, climate change, I'm sure. Um, and tell me the rest of the question. I, um, I mean, I, I know the watermen are certainly impacted. Many of the fisheries last year, many of our fish were actually mar migrating north of the Chesapeake Bay, and um, which is, I, I don't know if it's related to climate change, but it sounds like it could be, um, and. Um, that's that's a change, and certainly it does impact all of the commercial watermen when we depend on uh, what has been typically crabbing in the spring and summer and fishing certain species in the fall of the year. There weren't a spot here last year, of in, a small spot, but not to the um, extent that we normally see them in the fall. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely been affected. And while I'm not that knowledgeable on aquaculture, and, and I certainly, growing up, just knowing that fish were wild, you can put aquaculture-raised fish in the bay, and if they survive and flourish, that is awesome, because I probably couldn't tell the difference. I think it's awesome that we are looking at alternatives to keep our bay productive for all watermen and women. Thank you, Ida. And now we have a question for all three of you from the audience, which is, 
each of you talked about your own struggles, getting into these industries, getting into these spaces and, you know, the confidence that you had to carry to do so. Um, but how do we reach young women to recruit them as anglers? The br broad demographic of anglers is white, male, and generally older. Um, so how do we help get new people into these spaces and, you know, help to give them that confidence to take that first step? Okay, you want to go first? You want to go? Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, for me, um, one of the things that I think is super important to really build that confidence is giving, is having the opportunity to just be comfortable in that space. Um, having, you know, opportunities where you can go out with other, you know, with other women or with, you know, a group of people that you feel really comfortable with to get that like, you know, initial spark experience. Um, I think that that community can speak volumes. I think a lot of people kind of, you know, leave that part out of the equation, but I think that that community really helps somebody like want to push forward with all the things they want to do. Um, I also no think another thing is like, you know, providing the resources for them to do that. Um, you know, we could have, you know, a ton of females that are out on the water, but I think with, you know, just in my own experience, like, you know, not being able to do certain things or anything like that. I think that, you know, providing the resources so that they can have as much ample experience as they can in those spaces, it really, you know, builds that confidence as well. So I would say those are probably my two things. I'll add, I'll add on, um, in, in, kind of the last year as I've been, you know, discovering fly fishing and kind of going down all of the rabbit holes. Um, it's truly um, an, uh, a limitless sport to learn about. Um, I've had a lot of male mentors who um, I've really appreciated. And I think what I'm seeing, not just with my mentors, but like with the groups that they're fishing with and kind of beyond that there's a real ripple effect around um, kind of a racial, racial, uh, reckoning, um, understanding better what inclusion means, better understanding what equity means and diversity. And so like a national dialogue is helping, I think, bring concepts of inclusion and, and how, um, you know, some of these systems have been built, um, to exclude people over time. And in this situation, it's been a lot of women and, and people of color. Um, but I'm seeing this growing awareness in, you know, kind of the traditional communities that at least I've been intersecting with, or, you know, local chapters of Trout Unlimited, working to put on women workshops and doing a very diligent job of recruit, recruiting not just women, but women of color into those workshops. And so I, I'm really excited to see that. And I think that's going, that's where the change is going to happen is when the people who've been benefiting from the system for so long are the ones who are then also helping mentor and bring new folks in a, in a safe and inclusive way into the system, um, that, that gives me great hope. And as I said in my re remarks as well, I, I feel a deep responsibility to be a piece of that solution. And so, um, so I hope to continue to, to provide safe access to, um, to fly fishing um, for anyone who's interested. Um, from my perspective, I mean, certainly I had the family connection, which is this is something that is very rare today, even the, in, on the male part. But the Virginia Watermen's Association, which I served as secretary for until earlier this year, um, is actually trying to bring younger people into the watermen's culture. Uh, and this could be done by coming to the meetings or getting, uh, I think there's a Facebook page and a website, contacting them, uh, contacting the Virginia Waterman Association, attending some of the meetings, getting to know some of the people. There are both men and women, not as many women, and there are no other, it's all white, male and female. But, um, but certainly, this is an opportunity. I would think that you could meet other watermen who you might want to go out on their boat. And there are um, several women in there, uh, uh, Monica Shinneman and the, um, uh, not the, well, she works on, her husband works on the Potomac River, that would be able to 
take you out on the water and give you some experience and may, you know, to train you. And I know that the Virginia Waterman's Association at one time was trying to develop uh, a program that um, would help young people to find, uh, to be able to get into the industry by working with other watermen. And, and I think that's still a work in progress, but that's certainly one opportunity that is out there that I would suggest. That wraps up our question and answers. I do want to share that some people added some resources, um, which are Light Tackle Ladies, Becoming an Outdoors Woman, and United Women on the Fly. And we'll send those as well as additional resources out in an email to everyone that has participated today. Um, this webinar has also been recorded and will be available on your YouTube channel. So you can rewatch it and you can share it with other people who are interested in this topic. Again, we're so grateful to each of our speakers, Kate, Ida, and Amani. Thank you so much for taking the time today and for sharing your story and all of the knowledge that you've shared today. Um, we're also going to include in those resources links so that you can find out more about each of these women and their stories, um, as well as the organizations that they work with. Our next webinar will be on April 12th, and we will have um, the information for that also included in the follow-up resources. So we would love for all of you to join that as well. And thank you all for attending today and keep an eye on your email for all of those resources and the follow-up information from this webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>